Hi, this is Florida Natural Farming at Frog Valley Tropical Fruit Farm. And I want to talk about growing uh, rare aeroids, philodendrons, and anthuriums mostly, and organically, and uh, growing plants as medicine, because it's not just about food. If it's going to work, it has to be all plants must be grown as medicine. And a lot of you collect these rare aeroids that I've recently discovered and have been passionately pursuing and growing here for the last two months. Um, and we all know the pleasure we get from our plants. <clears throat> How satisfied you are when you get your box of new plants in the mail or go to the nursery and buy a plant. But nobody seems to pay attention to their health or the downstream effects of what they do to grow their plant. And a lot of you grow these plants indoors. I am growing these plants to grow in our orchard floor um, because that's what they're for. Um, so I'm starting them in the pots and then I'm going to start cutting them this summer and planting them out into the orchard floor. And they're really stunning. They're quite stunning, incredible plants. And um, I did get a few new ones. So I got this uh, Anthurium regale. I got this Anthurium regale verde. The leaves get like three feet plus on these things. Um, and then I got this Anthurium, or no, this is a, yeah, this is Anthurium, who is this? Oh, it's an exceptionally gorgeous one. Quirimolent seedling. I mean, the leaves get huge on this one. They're just stunning. And then I got this uh, Philodendron Charonia AFF. And I also got this philodendron fibrosum. Got nice petals. So we got 31 degrees one day and 32 degrees the next day outside here on the porch where I have these uh, tropical plants that they say can't go below 60 degrees. And I only noticed um, damage on two leaves. This philodendron furcatum, one of the leaves got messed up. And this philodendron, oh, there it goes. The philodendron uh, esmeraldense, uh, this is the only leaf that was like dangling and um, it's a gorgeous leaf and I got these plants and I'm so passionate about them because uh, like fungi they contain a lot of calcium oxalate and the calcium oxalate from the plant makes mineralized carbon in the soil from its leaf litter, like the fungi. So <clears throat> the calcium oxalate, it turns out, uh, regulates homeostasis in plants. So your plant's ability to function normally. So this is what I plant all of my plants in. And it's a uh, fungally dominant aged, biodynamic compost that forms aggregates when it starts drying out. That's soil. And um, all the plants do excellent in it. I've never found a plant that doesn't like it. Uh, even the cacti seem okay in it. And I it doesn't hold too much water, so you can't overwater it. It's not like cocoa core. Some of the stuff I see people planting their plants in, it's cocoa core is like the worst thing ever that I've noticed. And then there's sphagnum moss, and then um, 
wood bark and or cocoa cocoa bark and um, uh, pumice or perlite. That's what it is. They mix in with all that stuff and then they dump their synthetic chemicals on it in the plastic pots they're growing in and some of them grow in um, some of y'all grow in uh, like a hydroponic so the calcium that's in these plants is responsible for um, signaling to the soil to attract a response, usually in the form of a bacteria or something, bacteria or some other microorganism, to change the temperature in its leaf surface. So when you have a uh, and when you're growing hydroponically, your plant is uptaking all the nutrients. There's no controls. There's no uh, stressors. Well, there's stressors, but there's no, um, it has no control over what nutrients it's going to get. It's only going to get the nutrients you're providing. And that's okay if you keep the environment perfectly perfect for them. That's why I see so many people growing their um, plants inside of grow tents inside their house. Plastic grow tents. <clears throat> so when we have these plants for medicine, when we grow them for medicine, you pay attention to the uh, volatile organic compounds that the plant's releasing and the soil is releasing. So <clears throat> if you're using fungicides and uh, insecticides and synthetic chemicals, basically anything you're, you're feeding your plant or putting on your plant, plant hormones, those plants uptake those and they get released into the air. They combine with the plant beneficial VOCs, the biogenic VOCs, and they form a type of pollution that goes into the water of your plant, your soil solution, and you're in the air, because that's what they do. They go into the air. So at night, while you're sleeping and in your house, because Indoor air pollution is like the worst, worse than outside, they say. So if you're mixing all these basically uh, uh, path, uh, pollutants to grow your plant, they might give you a visual impact, but you're probably not going to get any health benefits from it. In fact, it's possible that it could eventually make you sick would be my guess, depending on what you're using. So if the plant, the, you know, the plant can't send a signal to its soil or to its growing medium, then it can't get a response back. So, you know, it can't, This, if I had these all in uh, hydroponic outside in the cold, they probably would have all melted, would be my guess or all turn brown. And then everyone grows in these plastic pots. Vinyl chloride is a real thing and it causes cancer and it goes into the air. So all this stuff that people don't pay attention to, to grow plants, is preventing us from having plants that are medicinal. I just wanted to say that and talk about the, the uh, why it's so important for everyone to get on board with um, eating organic and growing organic and paying attention. And it's not just about growing organic because 
Organic, the rules have gotten so slack and the management of the animals, uh, there's really no standard. It's the most uh, unhealthy uh, grow system for animals that is imaginable and all the pollutants they use to grow them and stuff. So you can't really just look at the organic standard. And so that's why I'm gonna talk a little bit about fruit trees, the tropical fruit trees. And um, you can see we got a little bit more freeze the second night because there was no breeze. So the top of the plants, some of them got frozen. Um, but overall, I think we did very well. The more biomass you have, the warmer your system's gonna get. So that's why the bigger your plants are and the more plants you have, the warmer your system is going to be. So if you have temporary cold, there's a, probably a mathematical equation you could figure out where how long, um, based on the number of pounds of plants you have, how long it will take for the plants to succumb to the freeze. <coughs> my guess how many how much time but so the organic stuff that they say they use on let's say mangoes to prevent fungal issues is completely unnecessary but for some reason they only look at like, a, it's like some sort of weird nutrient balancing scheme that they perfected to grow our food as poison, which is what it is when you're using chemicals, synthetic chemicals, and um, you're overdosing your plant with copper on its leaf surface and you're spraying it with sulfur. I mean, the copper builds up in your system and it can kill you. It can definitely damage your uh, internal organs for sure. The South Florida tropical fruit growers I tried to have a community with um, uh, kind of ran me off their platform as a quack, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little out there, but they, I periodically look and glance at what they suggest for mangoes, for tropical fruit trees in Florida. And I only have to like read like the first thing calcium. Calcium basically is the most abundant mineral on the planet, distributed evenly in quartz. Um, hi girls. One of my cows is gonna have a baby maybe today. So they say you need to apply calcium, gypsum, and boron, I think is what I read. Let's just, just talk about the calcium. Right, birds? So, you're saying that we need to apply calcium to grow our plants in our agricultural systems. The, 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 we have to apply it when we're growing on calcareous rock. And I also know that in nature, when there's plenty of calcium in the base rock of your soil, that Plants very rarely have calcium deficiencies. Huh. Okay, so why is the standard practice to apply calcium in our agricultural systems here in Florida? Um, when in nature, uh, calcium deficiencies very rarely happen in plants. This is when you have to look at all the downstream effects of what you're saying and why it, for that reason alone, it's a not a, growing plants as medicine, even though it can be considered organic. You gotta look at why, what you're doing in your system where 
you have a generic blanket statement that none of your plants can get calcium on their own. But the plants growing without your management don't exhibit any calcium deficiencies. So what are you doing wrong? What you're doing wrong is you're not looking at all this stuff. You're only looking at your nutrient. And that nutrient that they're mining here in Florida, your gypsum, is one of the major contributors to pollution in Florida and the destructive uh, outcomes that it's exhibiting in our waterways, in our natural ecosystems here. I don't know. Just people have been taught this and taught this and taught this. And it's not about the MPK. It's about looking at the whole system. So in the plant world, they just focus on the nutrients that they provide their plant, but for the house plants. And they also do the same thing in agriculture, conventional agriculture. They only look at one thing at a time, one nutrient, one pest killer, one one of the other thing, but they don't look at all the other stuff that grows in the natural system. So like a tablespoon of soil has a, what is it, a, a million microbes in it or something like that. More life in a tablespoon of soil than on, than all the humans on earth, something like that. So you're not looking at any of the stuff, all the microbes that are involved in um, getting the organisms, the, I mean, getting the nutrients because the microbes in the soil are nutrient scavengers. So probably you're a tablespoon of soil and um, a little earthworm castings and then just use a pinch of it in your pots would be better on your bark and your sphagnum moss than any nutrient that you could put in it. And it would definitely, definitely help the air quality in your house if you're, use, if you're bringing your plants indoors. And then everything gets treated the same. The farm system's the same way. Well, the problem with Florida is that the, we could, I, could, I could completely destroy this farm by mowing it within one season. If I start mowing it now, by the end of summer, or by the, yeah, spring, by, by sun, and probably the end of summer after it'd been raining, the system would be completely uh, devoid of any black soil. And um, I would have major problems getting it to survive without watering it. So, you're saying you have to apply a calcium on your magnos for better fruit when they have um, abundant calcium and trees and plants that grow in nature very rarely have uh, calcium deficiencies. So you, it's got to be your management style that's causing this. And calcium, if you can unlock calcium, the calcium uh, pathway, the calcium cycle in a plant, everything else will get into line if you if it can be done naturally because then the trees natural ability to combat fungal disease will be exhibited florida growers it's just like whoa you people are like uh not all. I mean, a lot of us are like, we figured it out. We know that it's wrong. Just that it's not ever explained correctly. And the information is like out there. It's being discovered. These chemicals are going to be probably uh, a banned eventually. Oh, 
most certainly all the insecticides and fungicides. <clears throat> and I mean, the average American eats 16 pounds of farm chemicals a year. And we have all these health problems in our society, major health problems. It's from the pollution. So we got some freeze. These mangoes that froze last year, those little ones right there, they, you see them? They weren't very big in this, but this was a horribly compacted area. See how brown it is? That's the compacted area. And then I didn't have enough plant biomass in there. I've planted like ginger and stuff in there, but it just doesn't, it doesn't grow. The citrus is fine. The citrus right in the middle there. These are all sugar apples that lose their leaves here, so it's not really a problem. But there's like one mango there. Where is it? And one mango there. It's like four mangoes that froze, maybe five. But what well, last year we got uh like 20, 20 or 30 man little mangoes, the young ones, in compacted areas. So in Florida, the, we've destroyed the soils with um, our mowing and uh, the driving on it. The calcium cycle does not work in a disturbed Florida soil. <clears throat> the pH of the soil in your, like, because that's what it is. It becomes very hot when it's got rainwater in it and the sun's beating on it. Then it becomes hot with the like shallow little root layer in there. It all becomes basically toxic to plant growing. That's why people apply their calcium. It's the management and that's not growing plants for medicine. It's really amazing the stuff they've figured out. Thank you very much for all the uh, research that's been done. So all these bananas up here froze, see them? I mean, I had, there's probably, I think probably uh, 90 bananas in here. But it looks like it's just like leaf damage. Even that big one back there that never got affected last year. It's got bananas on it. Got some leaf burn this year. Bananas look okay. I mean, it's not always perfect here. But these little mangoes, they seem to have made it this year. That one there, and there's one down there. This is a, the dead stuff's bananas, and there's some torch ginger in there and stuff. But the bananas will snap right back. I'm not even worried about it. I mean, that's just. They weren't going to produce this year anyway, so I mean, two years of 31 degrees for a low, and we got two days. The second day was worse for us because the frost was everywhere; it was covering on everything. But yeah, it's bizarre. The how eager everyone is to just um, destroy Florida. And um, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, I think this place is kind of proof that all the stuff that the conventional growers in Florida push is not only not as good, but it's wrong. I mean, it's definitely wrong for Florida. And if you're using your house plants in your house and you're not paying attention to the type of plastic that you're putting your plant in, probably any plastic I would think would be bad indoors. I mean, it's just, they break down. That's, they go into the air. Microplastics go into there. I'm just realizing that probably the dryer from micro or plastic shirts and stuff, uh, you know, probably outside. 
<clears throat> all this stuff you have to think of that nobody's cared to look at and pay attention to. It's all pollution that's causing our problems, our health problems for sure. This is where I have a lot of my favorite trees and plants and they seem to make it. Here's my seedlings of my citrus for this year and some jackfruit seedlings that are fine. There's a lot of biomass in here and it had the cover from this inga tree. Um, this is a juicy pearl star apple that had some leaf damage, but it, they're not going to fall off. They seem fine. The big achacha is like totally fine. You know, telling people to apply calcium in Florida is, I mean, it's really, it's like, it's like so, it was brought to you by people that are doing the mining and marketing it. That's, that's where that came from. If there's no shortage in Florida for calcium in the plants that grow naturally, why is there a shortage for your particular plant in your yard? So the calcium, it turns out, is responsible for um, all the circuitry and the um, the um, message and turning on and off uh, certain nutrients within the plant. So uh, for calcium oxalate is used for uh, in the plant for insect uh, pressures. And the nutrients go in and out of the plant, up and down. So why are you doing a sap analysis on the leaf and at that given moment the plant is a dynamic situation it's not uh your snapshot of an analysis inside the plant is not how that plant is going to be in 12 hours and sometimes it needs the reduction in the leaf of the tree in the nutrient that you deem it's short on to trigger a response in the soil to get the nutrients to come to it in the form of bacteria and other microbes that the plant attracts through its calcium signaling network. Not just your one nutrient. It might be a combination of nutrients that it can only get, nutrients and enzymes that it can only get through the bacteria, not through your mind substance. I don't know, that's just the stuff that's been going. See, we didn't really, it's like, it's minor damage considering we had two days of freezing temperatures, 32 and below. I didn't get stressed out over it. I kind of like to watch because it has never been so severe, knock on wood, but I kind of like to watch and see what happens. And usually when stuff gets frozen back, it comes back twice as strong. At least that's been my experience. You gotta have the environmental stressors and Florida colds a way of life. It's just, we're 10A, that's what it is here, zone 10A. <clears throat> The cacao, it really doesn't seem to be affected. And I noticed the, uh, the uh, Plinia inflata, the giant mulche, it didn't seem to mind at all in multiple locations right here. It's the cacao. But a lot of the trees that are more sensitive 
that I thought were more sensitive. Um, kind of were not. But that could be the location that the plant is in. Growing conditions, like the plant, change from spot to spot. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Let's see if this Garcinia was blooming. I don't think any of the other Garcinias were affected. It's two years in a row. It's gotten down to 31 degrees here. The more carbon in plant material and plants I get growing in here, the warmer it will stay <clears throat> to get through. Uh, I got these gingers. I need to plant some more of those because they didn't seem to get affected. And I know ginger freezes at 31 to 32 degrees. But see, the bananas got it though. But they'll send out new growth. They didn't, they're not going to die back to the ground. There's some that didn't. One leaf is still good. This Inga. Uh, Cinnamonia froze to the ground last year, but this year didn't even suffer anything. So I think there's a uh, little bit of memory that goes on with these plants. Probably. There's just so much we don't know and understand that we're starting to. Um, It's like we figured out that the insecticides make people stupid. <clears throat> they damage your brain. They don't even study the effects of multiple insecticides mixed with the chemicals, mixed with the fungicides effects on your brain, mixed with your water soluble nutrients. <laughs> Our agro systems definitely still have a lot, a long way to go um, uh, before they're growing any food for as medicine. Anyway, this is Frog Valley Tropical Fruit Farm. Cacao didn't get affected. The fruit didn't draw. Dry farm cacao in Florida. Yes, it's possible. You don't even have to put down anything. It's a little manure. It's Frog Valley Tropical Fruit Farm. I hope you have a good day.